Thank you. Imagine music that could heal a culture. When I was very small, we had a hi-fi system and a small collection of classical albums. I listened to Demolda by Smetna and The Firebird Suite by uh, Stravinsky and Beethoven's Pastorelle. I played, put that on the, on the stereo and played it when I was sick because it was my healing music. When I was 13, my best friend gave me the latest hit, Meet the Beatles. <laughs> my mom took a look at it, said, that's trash, throw it out. I hit it. <laughs> but the lesson had been learned. Listening to music was not a matter of preference. It was about listening to the right music, which was composed by good composers, and the wrong music, which was trash. This caused some pretty serious cognitive disconnect in me. And uh, the rebellion began. By the time I got here to college, I had stopped listening to classical music altogether. At that time, my healing music was the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Remember them? As I came of age, I came to understand that my parents were very well-meaning, but they were mistaken. They were doing some kind of a moral conflation in their heads, which really had more to do with propriety. Now, propriety is one of those words that refers back to group identity, right? So if you follow the rules of etiquette for the group to which you wish to belong, you're invited in. If you can't, won't, don't, forget it. And these were notions that didn't sit well and required scrutiny on my part. So I'm here this afternoon to ask you to look at your attitudes about classical music in the United States. And in this, I'm talking about the symphony orchestra, the, uh, from the Boston Symphony Orchestra all the way down to, but really mostly about community volunteer orchestras such as the Lowell Philharmonic Orchestra in Lowell, Mass. Imagine a culture that values authenticity over propriety. Every institution has walls. I'm here, you're there, there's a wall. Propriety is a social construct that sets up all kinds of walls, all artificial. My husband's partner in their sound and light business in Boston is Dave, who is from Southie. He speaks with a South Boston accent so thick you need subtitles, right? And he dresses in a black t-shirt, black jeans, with a long chain everywhere. But he's a genius in the sound booth. Dave told me about the time that uh, he and some friends got tickets to the, uh, the symphony orchestra, so they went and they sat down. And Dave found himself sitting next to a blue-haired patron of the arts. <laughs> she looked him over and said, what are you doing here? Dave, being Dave, said, yeah, i like to come to the concert. <laughs> mm. She said, well, I'm quite surprised you'd want to be here. <sighs> well, Dave knows walls. He knows walls of economics, of education, of class. But he's so brilliant and, and so motivated that he just bulldozes right on across those tracks. My daughter-in-law, Sarah, college educated, a school teacher in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, she's a real music lover. So I asked her about her, her thoughts about uh, the symphony orchestra. And she said, well, you know, I like classical music, but I just don't know very much about it. Um, you know, it's really, really what I grew up with. I grew up with indie and folk rock and, and, and pop, and I like that. She thought a bit, and she said, you know, it's because it's kind of dancing, grooving, jamming. Yeah? Dave Struthers really kind of run to death metal on his truck radio. But the fact is that both of them listen to what they know. They listen to what is familiar. So therefore, it seems as though we have two cultures here. 
we have European classical cook culture of these great symphonic pieces, and we have this wonderful body of American homegrown popular music. So how can we get the two together? Oh, well, that's easy. The pops. <laughs> Imagine a music industry that respects our roots. The Pops, not limited to, but mostly involving pop tunes set to uh, the strings, arranged for the strings. Nowadays, though, we tend to think more of the, the about 130 years later, right? Uh, we think of the Boston Pops on the, at the 4th of July on the Esplanade, right? Playing for a sea of people. However, classical music musicians have a few bits of ambivalence about playing this music. D don't get me wrong, we love playing fun music that is well written, but we have some feelings that maybe we're being asked to compromise our artistic ethics. You see, it's made very, very clear to us that the Pops is about the bottom line. Butts in seats. And this obsession with money starts at the top with the corporate music industry who wants to use a world-class symphony orchestra to legitimize a pop artist that they are promoting. Now the idea that legit musicians, and that is a real term, are being kind of shanghaied into being a backup band for a pop artist no matter how good they are, and they are just so some corporate suit can make a ton of money. Now that causes some ethical concerns. Ah, but this is entertainment, right? Come on, just chill, right? We have an appreciative audience and we're making music. What's the source of the music? African Americans, immigrants, those people. And now by definition, illegitimate. illegitimate. Will somebody please tell me in what way does popular music need to be legitimized by anybody? Oh, but high culture, we're elevating the music, right? Now, I have yet to meet a pop artist who feels their music needs to be legit or uh, to be elevated. Although nobody turns down a paid gig, I can tell you that. The, the issue really started when the music industry becoming aware of the tremendous amount of demand for popular music saw cash cow. And so they assimilated the music, they appropriated it. Then they got their legal departments to write up all kinds of proprietary agreements. And what they ended up with was a music that was sanitized, made playable by strings, and palatable for mostly white audiences. And if you don't believe me, Google, audience photos, 4th of July, Esplanade. I did. I did. People demand Pops concerts because they want to hear something that's familiar. They want to hear music they know. And they're not thinking about corporate, and they're not thinking about the faces in the crowd. And they're, they're certainly not thinking about our artistic ethics, right? They're there to have fun with their families, and that is the way it should be. And the Pops started as a way to take this European culture that was coming over in droves on boats and combine it with a tremendously vital, homegrown popular culture here. But it didn't work. Greed and bias created division. And the people, the people whose music that originally belonged to they're not really that interested in coming to the concerts. Case in point, we did market research in downtown Lowell with person in the street interviews asking people's attitudes about symphonic music. Vanessa, an African-American woman, early 40s, dressed in a business suit, agreed to answer some questions. I asked her, how frequently do you go to the symphony, pops or otherwise? Whoa, do in the headlights, she said. Occasionally? Yeah. I said, okay, what can we do to make you want to come to hear a concert? Oh, that took her back. 
She looked at me like this and she thought and she answered honestly, you could make the music more interesting. Imagine a repertoire that is a just and truthful representation of who we are as Americans. This next little part is kind of uh, like the intermission, right? When you would be looking at your program and reading the notes about the pieces you've been hearing, except you can't because they're all on the screen behind me. And the thing is, is, is what you've been hearing has nothing to do with the slides because I'm making my own symphony here. But this now, this will give you a chance to read the attribution and I can tell you about uh, the reasons I chose these pieces. I chose Beethoven because of the antecedent, uh, because, because we need to respect all of our sources. About a minute into the third movement of uh, the Pastoral Symphony, he quotes a, a little um, uh, Austrian folk dance of, of the day and he pokes a, a little gentle fun at a, a group of uh, local musicians for whom he actually wrote, in which the oboe player tended to come a bit early and the bassoon player a little bit late. Listen to it. Ralph Govlik is at Boston College. He was born in Germany, unadopted. He was adopted. His mother was uh, from Turkey and she found herself uh, pregnant out of wedlock and so fled for her life and gave up Ralph for adoption. Um, he was raised, and then she disappeared back into Turkey. So he was raised in uh, Germany, emigrated to the United States. And his music, and I know you've never heard of him, but, but I hope you'll look him up. His music is powerfully emotional, uh, deeply classical, uh, and uh, using a lot of poetry and text um, uh, sources. De la Masabrosa is a line from uh, Cervantes' poem, Don Quixote. Florence Price came to critical acclaim uh, in the late 1930s. She moved to Chicago and lived there pretty much for her life, and as such was kind of a westward expansion of the Harlem Renaissance. The uh, Juba movement of her uh, third symphony is characteristic of the music that she grew up with, but her music became largely lost and is only just now starting to be recovered. Roberto Sierra, what a lovely man. I had a great conversation with him. He came from Puerto Rico originally. He teaches at uh, Cornell University now. Fandango's is a very popular piece of his and one, one of my favorite pieces of all time. It's kind of a construction, deconstruction, reconstruction of this old Spanish harpsichord Baroque piece. Right, and, and I like it because it's got that bolero groove that goes all the way through it, but Sierra is very clever about the deconstruction where he just it falls apart and then brilliantly comes back together again. Jennifer Higdon is at Curtis Institute of Music. She too has kind of an uh, uh, interesting background because she didn't grow up with classical music. She grew up with folk and rock and roll, and as her genius began to emerge, she um, felt that she had to really pay, play a lot of catch. She had to work extra hard to catch up with her, with her classmates. And now, um, Pulitzer Prize and a few Grammys later, I think she's done the job. <laughs> Blue Cathedral is a tone poem that, um, um, that is kind of one of her signature pieces, and you can listen to that now. Now all of the music clips are gonna line up with the slides for you. Imagine a sharing music community. There is fierce competition for grants, for cheap rehearsal space, for audience, for even musicians. And so you can't blame community performing arts groups for holding their cards pretty darn close. When I was doing uh, my uh, um, orchestra research in Lowell, Mass, Sean, who was then the president of the Lowell Philharmonic uh, Orchestra, the amateur group, emailed me and he said, are you gonna be booking your concerts on the same nights as us? 
Well, okay, so to me, being a good art citizen is not threatening my sister organizations. And I told Sean that, and I also told him that we wouldn't be double booking our concerts because, Sean, if you remember, I play with the Lowell Phil, <laughs> right? I sit behind you. <laughs> Lack of access is such a critical problem, especially in the community arts because there's no money. And access to new music in particular is it's almost unattainable. You can't really buy it. It's very expensive to rent. And what is not in print, which is most of it, is all proprietary. So what's left is school music or what's in the public domain. And you can guess that's standard European rep. What if I could tell Sean that a piece my professional group uh, commissioned and premiered this season, I could make available to Lowell Philharmonic next season for nothing more than the cost of the royalty back to the composer. Ownership of critical resources back in the hands of its creators offers the promise of healthier arts communities by working from the bottom up with support from the top. Oh, but the plight of the composer, oh my gosh. Um, can you imagine writing a piece for months or even years and having to beg an orchestra, even pay an orchestra to perform it? Now, this isn't my personal experience because actually I'm not a composer, I'm a conductor. But, um, but I, I work for them, I do copy work for them. Um, so then they would get like one rehearsal from this orchestra and a single performance. Kind of shaky, right? It hasn't had chance to, to uh, lock in. And then the piece goes, never heard from again. This happens with thousands of pieces of music that are out there. You know, that just doesn't seem right because as a conductor, I need time to develop my interpretation. And my, my musicians, need to get it under their fingers, right? But mostly, most importantly, you. You need a chance to hear it a few times, right? It's got to grow on you. Maybe it'll stick. I guarantee you, history will take care of longevity. If we've learned anything from the corporate music industry, it is how critical it is to create demand. Because demand steers growth. Growth fosters familiarity. And familiarity creates good old canon. And canon is just a fancy inside word for billboard top hits. Yeah. Imagine our greatest talent taking their place on the world stage, right? I chose this piece, The uh, Three Black Kings by Duke Ellington. Not because Ellington drew from the source, but because he was the source. I can sum this up in a kind of a syllogism, uh, if you'll allow me, based on uh, uh, Aristotle's uh, rule book for the arts, the poetics. In an Aristotelian sense, the symphony orchestra is on that royal road to universal truth with music as a medium. Our folk music is the universal outcry of the human condition. That's why it's popular, you know. So therefore, doesn't it make sense that our source music, our folk music, deserves a ticket to ride on that royal road in an Aristotelian sense? But for high culture to punch that ticket, there's a bit of reckoning that has to be done. The timeless music of the European tradition is revered, and it should be. It absolutely should be. But this culture needs to stop hiding behind another culture's group identity. And then we in the orchestra business need to do some serious soul searching about bias and this infernal obsession with the bottom line. And then 
Ah, then we need to have a serious conversation about race and class as it relates to music in this country. Then perhaps we can uh, program some concerts where Dave can come dressed the way he is and not feel like he's on the other side of the tracks. And Sarah can come with her kids, my grandkids, right? They can dance the night away. And Vanessa can hear her beautiful self reflected in the music. If Beethoven could use his country music, countryman's music, to create a classical repertoire that heals, then can't we as Americans do exactly the same? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Oh, you know, I'm hearing something. You, I'm hearing something in my head. You can't hear it because it hasn't been written yet. Imagine a bassoon concerto based on the bass line to Michael Jackson's Beat It. Ba -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. Yeah, 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 because in those eight notes, there's enough American DNA, motivic DNA, that Gustav Mahler and Richard Strauss would be fighting each other to develop it. Yeah? You know, somebody should write it. Maybe one of you. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you write it and it's good, I'll program it. Thank you.